Okay, so uh, can you see my screen, Rusty? Yes, I can, yes. You're, you're Excellent. looking good. All right. Hello to everyone and welcome to our Mechanical Engineering Virtual Meetup. And uh, today's topic uh, is Learning Factory Design with Autodesk Solutions. My name is Anton Fedosev, I'm the Content Strategist at Customer Success. And today's guest is uh, Rusty Belcher, Manufacturing Expert and Certified Instructor from RAND Worldwide. So we will uh, get to introductions a little bit later, but I wanted to remind you about what mechanical engineering virtual meetups are and how it works. So first of all, all the lines are currently muted because we are recording uh, this webinar. Uh, the recording will be posted so you can watch this one and all the previous episodes at any point of time. Um, the agenda today, so we'll again quickly introduce ourselves, remind about how it works, and then we will discuss about the factory design workflow in general, uh, what we have in factory design utilities, and how to learn them effectively using the, some of the courseware that we produced, and also we'll actually go through the contents um, of that uh, learning content and quickly briefly mention about some of the partnerships. And of course, since it's live, we're live, uh, so we highly encourage you to ask questions in the end of the webinar and also during the uh, webinar itself. So we'll try to answer those um, during the webinar. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, mechanical engineering virtual meetups, they happen every second Thursday of each month. Uh, and uh, we talk about different topics in the industry, invite, uh, internal experts from Autodesk, from the industry, and product managers. Today, we expected to have product manager from uh, Factory Design Suite, but you know, uh, uncertain times, so uh, he unfortunately couldn't make it today. Um, and uh, we have another series for uh, manufacturing uh, on generative design. So this is more dedicated uh, for this topic. Uh, while in the mechanical engineering meetup, we have a rotation of topics and the topic is different each time. For um, other professions, we have also uh, another series of uh, webinars. Uh, we have the ones for architects, beam managers, civil engineers, plant designers, and electrical engineers. So the links are available. So I will post it in the chat a little bit later. And I'd like to introduce uh, Rusty Belcher. Uh, Rusty, can you say a couple of uh, words about you and uh, your history in the industry? Yeah, sure. Um, hey, welcome. My name is Rusty Belcher. Uh, I am a, a mechanical application expert or manufacturing application expert. Uh, working, I work with Rand Worldwide, as Anton said, uh, specifically with Imagine It. Uh, been working with uh, Inventor and the 3D side of modeling for the past 20 some odd years. Um, uh, about 10 years ago, I was very fortunate enough to work with the initial project manager at Autodesk for the factory design utilities. And for the past 10 years, those utilities have really dominated my professional life. So uh, um, uh, I, I am a, I'm a ship builder at uh, I tr it was my trade that's what I went to school for I was a ship fitter worked in the shipbuilding industry and uh, uh, graduated there uh, again about 20 some odd years ago from uh, I ended up working in their mold loft group um, and then uh, through AutoCAD and then mechanical desktop and inventor I wound up with you guys today so uh, really glad to be here really pri privileged to to talk to you guys today yeah, it's uh, it's great to have you. Thank you for uh, joining us today. And the, the first question you mentioned about that uh, factory design uh, topic dominated uh, your you know professional tenure recently, right? So, sure. what are some of the things that made you like the tool set, and what keeps you excited for so many years? So, what what are the key elements that you love yeah. about? I, I remember um, the initial project manager, his name was Shabai Bekchi, of the product design manufacturer, of the, I'm sorry, the factory design utilities. And um, I ended up working with him because of my, I, I knew Navisworks. Uh, from the shipbuilding industry, we'd been using Navisworks for a while. And uh, when Autodesk acquired that tool, they, they put out a call for anyone, hey, do y'all know Navisworks? And 
I, I volunteered or I was volunteered for, for uh, that project. And I remember Shabai, when we finished the Navisworks integration, I remember him saying to me, hey, we got these new factory utilities. You should really take a look at these. And he, he, you know, he, I think we're all kind of marketing geniuses in the background. We all, we're proud of what we produce. We're, we're, we're excited about the tools. And of course, I think a lot of us as users are always a bit skeptical. And he started to talk about the fact that you could drag these assets in and land them on a floor. Mm -hmm. And uh, he talked about how easy it was, and how simple it was. And, you know, my prior experience with the tool sets, you know, with Inventor, I'm just imagining hundreds of constraints and I'm imagining all this other, all the other things that go with um, creating large assemblies. Mm -hmm. And I remember when Shabai showed me the factory utilities and it was one of those jaw dropping moments that, um, goodness sakes, these these utilities are fascinating and, and they are exactly as easy to use as was promised um, after teaching it for so long. That's one of the things that as a teacher, I have to be careful of that the students come in expecting to learn, you know, this really difficult application. And they all just after the first couple of hours, they look at me like, you mean, this is it. This is it's, it's actually as easy <laughs> as you advertised. Um, and then, of course, throughout the time as the as the tools developed we've been able to add more and more intelligence to these assets so mm -hmm. that it, it, it goes, it really does go beyond parametric modeling into uh, the fact that, you know, you can create assets that, that really, um, that really are so versatile and so many options. And the fact that they talk to each other, it opens up so many uh, options for designers in our world today. So, the work that's come from it for me has been not just teaching it and, and implementing it, but working with uh, professionals in all types of industries as far as uh, what kinds of information can we build into our assets and how can they talk to each other and and literally almost how can they almost lay themselves out um, almost automatically when you put them on the factory floor. So it is, yeah, it's a very and, exciting tool to work with. It really is. Yeah, and thank you so much for, uh, you know, telling this story because it goes um, quite a bit back in time, right? And uh, yeah. it's good to see this original intent. And uh, I'm glad that you mentioned the original product manager of uh, Factory Design Utilities. But let's lay it out, right? So when we think about the workflows, right, um, what do we see here, right? So um, the uh, again, we will be following the courses uh, that have been created. But in general, like uh, what are the most you know simple way to think about the uh, workflow in actor design utilities? So when you talk about workflows, we actually um, just as a preview of what's coming up, we created four courses. Um, I was really, again, I was very fortunate to be part of the factory design team early on. And uh, one day uh, the project manager said, would you be interested in writing the book for the classes? And I, yeah, absolutely. I'll do that. Um, and I uh, took a crash course in writing textbooks and, and produced a textbook that probably has a lot of mistakes still in it, but uh, but got a chance to do that. And, uh, you know, I've seen people, the way people learn is, has changed over the years. So we've kind of moved away from the classic textbook in a class scenario and we move towards the online learning scenarios. And we just got finished putting together four classes for the customer success portal and in regards with how to use the, the application. So when you talk about workflows, that's one of our first classes in the, uh, in the series. Uh, Really, you have, um, it's funny, there's a class called 1D, 2D, 3D. Uh, the first thing you think about is organizing your thoughts uh, before CAD ever gets into the picture. So you have what is process analysis. You have tools that help you map out your process while it's still conceptual. Uh, you can then analyze your process for productivity, for production sake, uh, in terms of time, in terms of manpower. Uh, then once you have an idea, a solid idea of the of the workflow that you need or the, the flow of the factory, the flow of the material or the product that goes through your, your building, then you move into CAD. You typically move into the first dimension, 
which is 2D AutoCAD. And the factory utilities are built on top of AutoCAD. So you have that environment to build upon where you can get that initial footprint laid out of, you know, you've got your building, you've got, you've got your machines that are specific to your uh, industry. Uh, these machines at this point could just be big rectangles as far as we're concerned, but it's all about, you know, it's about space planning, it's about flow, uh, but eventually you're going to reach a, a, a saturation factor in, in 2D where you need to move into the 3D side of things. So you can move seamlessly from the 2D workflow into the inventor workflow, which is the, the 3D factory development. Um, and once you get to the third dimension, once you get into 3D with Inventor, it almost becomes a cycle. You'll see yourself going back to AutoCAD and adjusting some 2D data and having that automatically update the 3D data. You'll jump into the 3D data and adjust some things and automatically update your 2D drawing. So uh, that's those are the general workflows. The factory design utilities are built on top of AutoCAD, Inventor, and Navisworks. So the main workflows in the, in the first lesson you take, uh, the first lesson that I created, uh, the, we focus on the factory utilities inside of AutoCAD and their general use. We talk about the factory utilities inside of Inventor and their general use. And we also talk about the general use of the process analysis tools. So um, mm -hmm. those are the three main the three main workflows that we talk about in the class. There is a fourth workflow. There is the idea of of once you have the factory done, and in 3D, you want to experience it. You want to uh, almost have a, a virtual reality experience of it. And that's where the Navisworks tool comes in. We haven't done a Navisworks, uh, a really Navisworks focused lesson yet, but um, being able to have that entire factory and to step into it, to walk around and, and to literally hold things and, and see what the place is gonna be like, it's an invaluable, um, it's an invaluable design tool. Uh, I just I'm working with a, a customer now, and they do um, they do incineration plants for uh, cleaning up the environment, and uh, they it the Navisworks side of their project is so critical because that's where they make their really complex processes look clean and simple for uh, another user to look at. They need to present their data to somebody and and bring them into the facility and show them how it's going to be laid out and that's that the Navisworks side of it the digital mock-up side of it is critically important so that's another workflow to consider yeah and uh, let's uh, jump into some of those workflows uh, so as uh, rusty mentioned uh, the courses um, have been created and published we'll uh, send the link so everyone can access the courses download the files exercises and um, you know explore it but we I mean, if you don't have time since you joined, we'll go through some of the content from the courses and we'll explain you how everything works, uh, kind of the foundations. And uh, the first, uh, start to give you an idea about like how it actually works in the product. Um, this is the uh, representation of the videos. So uh, each of the videos and in, in the courses, uh, there is this navigation menu that allows you to know exactly where you are in the overall process. Then you get the files uh, to work with, step-by-step -step instructions. And also, uh, this is a representation of the videos that you have in the courses. And in this case, this is how the first um, kind of scene looks like, right? When uh, we start designing in 2D, right? Yeah, I mean, in this particular example, you see, you know, in early AutoCAD, a conveyor could be just a simple polyline or uh, a machine might be just a simple rectangle. And the factory utilities, we, we certainly, uh, it, we really focus on the factory utilities and how they're integrated into AutoCAD. Um, we bring in the footprint of the building through an XREF. So you're using your classic AutoCAD commands that you're used to, but you're now incorporating these new factory utilities to do things like convert a polyline to a conveyor run or uh, you explore assets that are available in the asset browser and drag and drop machines in and place them uh, in context of the building. Um, we talk a lot in the class, I, I just see the video here, we talk a lot about the fact that um, you can have multiple people working on these projects as long as they all use the same zero zero point. 
you can have as many people working in different areas of the facility as possible. So uh, it's a very collaborative type of environment that you get to utilize. But uh, what you see on the screen is typically the AutoCAD workflow. We're talking about the early stages of trying to incorporate this conceptual design into your either your existing building or uh, a new building that you plan on creating. So, um, And talking about the building, can you say a couple of words about the project itself? Uh, because it's the same project that we uh, take in the very beginning and then uh, go through the process of designing the factory. So what this project is about. Yeah, this particular line, uh, there's a palletizing or a packing station in, on one end of the line. You've got a machine that basically folds and packs cardboard boxes. And then as the boxes uh, become folded and packed, you then make bundles of them and you package those. And they move uh, via robot and conveyor line down the line until they reach a, a pallet stacker or palletizer. Uh, and then they move off to shipping. So it's a this particular line is is very it's brief in in the real world sense you know that factories have much larger uh, examples of these packing stations but we tried to keep the data set small and simple so that it's easily downloadable it's easily um, uh, we address the concepts that you know w w regardless of the size of your factory we address the concepts that you're going to be faced with. Um, moving from or, or developing your 2D layout uh, in this particular case. Uh, yeah. You can see in the video, we're, we're accessing the uh, assets from the asset browser, uh, being able to drag those in and place those exactly uh, in context of our simple geometry. Uh, the asset browser is uh, it's just one of those factory utilities that really gives you a, a, a very extensive library of factory components that you can easily add to your overall uh, layout. And so it's a mix of cloud assets and also local assets, or all of them are cloud? So both. Uh, the, so you get a local library, you get a very, it, a relatively small local library that comes when you, when you install the application. Um, you have a vast cloud library at your disposal. So folks mm -hmm. are all the time creating assets. I just created a number of assets the other day and uploaded a bunch of them to the cloud and uh, published them globally. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the asset library on the cloud is continually expanding, getting bigger and bigger. But the real power of the factory utilities is the fact that you can create your own assets. Uh, mm -hmm. you, can, you can build your machines the way you want them to behave and appear. Uh, you are not locked yeah. into any any static library. It's a very dynamic system. And we will talk about that a little bit later sure. today, some of the best practices of how to create your own models. But you see, of course, we're not going to watch the entire video, but the uh, what we were trying to tell here is that on top of your uh, standard AutoCAD functionality, you get a new tab, right, with the right. new workflow and a huge library of components that you can use in a smart way. It has all the attributes, uh, the library is extensive and you can just insert them, uh, drag and drop, and uh, you get the representation of your 2D um, layout of the factory. And uh, let, let me kind of fast forward what's happening here, right? Yep. Yeah, I, th I think a couple of big ones in this particular lesson, uh, converting the polylines to a conveyor line. So you can convert a single polyline into a, into a row of assets, a, a line of assets. That's just, that's just one of the, of the utilities that's available to you. You can, in place, you can place the assets in manually one at a time. You can snap them together. They have uh, little connector points that allow them to fit together like, uh, I always say like little Lego bricks. Uh, little toy plastic bricks you used to play with when you were a kid, um, which in all honesty, that's how a lot of us want our CAD experience to be. We want yeah. it to be simple and, and precise. So, um, but working with assets is a, uh, I think uh, most of us in AutoCAD and the AutoCAD side of things, we're used to working with blocks. That's all these assets are in the AutoCAD side. It's just a block. There's no special sauce but that block has a tie into this asset library that you'll see eventually there is a 3d counterpart to that 2d footprint so when you're an inventor you have the exact same experience you're just dropping in a 3d 
component instead of a 2D component. Yeah, this is exactly where I wanted to pause this video. You see after uh, Rusty designed uh, the uh, 2D representation of the factory floor, uh, saved the file, and there is this button open in Inventor. This is exactly what's happening, right? So yep. there will be um, modeling Inventor will be opened and the 3D representation of those assets will be automatically populated because... It's, uh... It's really yeah. neat to see this and that in this part, at this point in time, you only have this AutoCAD drawing. That's all you have. But when you click the Inventor button, Inventor takes over and it builds the 3D design based on your 2D footprint. And, it, and they're linked together so that if one changes, you have the option to update the other. And so I can drive the 2D design from Inventor. Uh, I can drive the 3D design from AutoCAD. Um, the, one of the unique things about the factory layout process is it, it's, it's been historically 2D driven, right? We, we, if you're in this business, you're used to top-down views of these massive facilities. Um, but we long for the 3D side of things because 3D explains so much that we're missing in these 2D drawings. And to be able to have both of these environments available to hop into when you need it is, it's just a phenomenal environment to work in. Uh, you can answer all your questions ahead of time. You can find so many issues dealing with the 3D side of things that are not apparent doing the 2D, the classic 2D footprint. Uh, and then once it's 3D, I mentioned the Navisworks side and being able to immerse yourself in the design and find so many different ways to enhance the design, make it better, all before the initial uh, incorporation or the initial um, breaking the ground or, or installing machines on the floor. Um, oh gosh, uh, it's, it is digital prototyping for the factory layout process. Let's talk about something that is, well, related, but very often it's a difficult topic to just even think about, right? Because uh, not all factories start from scratch, right? Very often there is an existing building right. and a uh, big topic is like, okay, brown, brownfield when there is an existing um, building facility and what options do we have here? We're covering this in courses, but let's uh, discuss it uh, in the webinar as well. So we start from existing conditions and what's going on here. So yeah, with brownfield work, you know, you've got a building. It, you, it, it could be a building you just purchased, could be a building that you've just cleared out and you want to rearrange the floor, but the the shell of the building is in place, and you need to um, record that shell in a way so that you can faithfully put your new workflow in context of that shell. Um, so verifying the initial conditions is incredibly important. You know, quite often we, we, we gloss over the fact that this building might be in another state. It could be in another country or another, uh, uh, another part of the world. And, and you might not live right beside of it. So you might have to go there and, and record the data. You know, sometimes it's a notebook, pen and paper, um, a lot of photographs, uh, things like that. Quite often we want to, you know, certainly uh, money's not a not not an option, right? So uh, you know we can incorporate laser scanning into this. So going in and and recording the building, however you do it, is kind of a critical first step uh, to you know verifying the initial conditions, and then moving on to you know capturing them and utilizing those initial conditions in your factory layout tools. So it we, it could be the fact that you create a, an AutoCAD footprint of the building. Uh, you can incorporate that on top of a laser scan or or uh, just various things. But usually, usually Brownfield starts off with that initial 2D AutoCAD footprint of the building. However you got it, however you came about it, you, uh, you get that footprint and then you incorporate that either as an XREF to the 2D workflow we talked about earlier, or you can bring in that AutoCAD into Inventor with the factory utilities and lay that 2D footprint on the floor. So once you get your once you get your shell in place or your boundary in place, now we can start dropping in our assets. We can start uh, analyzing real distances as far as our processes go, uh, and seeing you know really how much machinery and people we can cram into 
the, the, the building and, and maximize the productivity of the space. Yeah, and uh, once we have the 2D uh, floor, that already allows you to create a quick box, right, in 3D right. because AutoCAD architecture is there. And even without like overcomplicating, it, it is possible to create a box, right? Yeah, the um, I know we uh, in the in the demo set we give you the building, and I know that uh, a lot of us are not architects. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that that uh, I discovered early on with these tools was AutoCAD architecture, and it's it's a really unsung hero in this whole group of tools. Um, but if you know AutoCAD at all, and you can get somebody to point you into the right direction as to where the wall tools are and the uh, the doors and the windows, you'd be surprised how fast you can draw uh, a footprint of a building with simple AutoCAD architecture. If you wanted to take it to the extreme, like we did in this example and do the entire building in 3D, uh, you can do that in AutoCAD architecture, but usually this is where we would rely on, a, on an architect, uh, someone who's who's got probably Revit or one of the architectural tools at their disposal to, to put the building together. It's possible to do it in Inventor, but I, I don't think I'd recommend it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is what we already discussed, right? Verifying uh, the elements between the 2D drawing that you have and the yeah. model that you have uh, in I digital we, form. I think we, re we recommend in the, uh, in the courses, we talk about the fact that AutoCAD architecture is a tool we do, uh, we actually pull the wall, uh, at one point we pull the wall tool out and show you how easy it is to make these 3D walls. Uh, they're 2D at first, but they appear to be 3D later on. So um, getting the footprint in place is critical for the brownfield uh, process. And then once you have the footprint in place, you're really at the beginning of the previous uh, workflow uh, presentation. So. Um, so yeah. because, yeah, we went kind of back in time, right? Because you not always start from scratch, right? Uh, we That's right. To yep. how, to, how to generalize it and get to where we were in the previous discussion, right? Sure. Um, yeah, and you already recognize exactly the step before, right? Uh, what we saw in the previous video, this is already, you imported the uh, the floor. Uh, yep. and right, you this is the inventor, uh, this is the inventor environment for the factory utilities. There's a floor. Um, that's one of the amazing things is to see an inventor. You see this ground plane, and yeah, you you one. have the um, the DWG underlay command to bring in the the footprint, reference that, and then you start to drop your 3D assets in context of this 2D floor. Um, I mentioned point clouds. We we talk a little bit about this. You can bring in the point clouds, and you can literally drop your assets in place in context of the 3D building, the building that you've captured. Um, I, I've gotten a chance to teach at AU a couple of times with the factory utilities, and uh, one of my favorite classes I've taught at AU is the factory design utilities and point clouds. It's just, it's amazing to, uh, uh, to start off by scanning a building, and then you can wipe out all the machinery that's in there. Uh, the Autodesk Recap app is, is available to you. So you end up with an empty building, uh, but then you can take your digital assets and mount them in context of this laser scan point cloud. Um, and, and is it the right way to think about the scan that it's basically one of the 3D assets that you place in your model, right? That you can use, right? There is um, there is a workflow that I've promoted a couple of times. It's uh, it's part of it's part of the point cloud class that I talk about. In that, instead of scanning the building, think about scanning machinery. If I go to all, if I go all around a piece of machinery and scan it, might take it might take me an hour and a half or so to scan a machine, but I have the then I have the 3D machine in point cloud form, and there is actually a workflow to take that 3D machine, get rid of everything else except that part of the cloud, and build an asset out of that. So literally, I if I have the machine already, I don't have to model it. I don't have to make it a 3D model. I can scan it and use that um, as it, as long as it's the right size and shape and it's it's accurate to a degree that uh, I can rely on it, yeah, I, I can skip the whole modeling process and just use point clouds as assets and rearrange 
Maybe you're just rearranging the equipment that you already have, not introducing new equipment. So there are certainly workflows that uh, reality capture plays into with the factory utilities. And what about the 2D representation in this case? You just manually kind of draw the box uh, around the laser scan or what's your recommendation there? So laser scans are just points in space. That's all they are. So they do not produce, uh, if you're an inventor user, they don't produce visible edges when you go to do the drawing view. And mm -hmm. um, in many cases, people would then trace them to create the footprints that they go they use. But if you're going to create a, a point cloud asset, one of the things you do, once you have the machine in the cloud, you get it into inventor, you, you land it and align it to the coordinates of the X, Y, Z coordinate system. You basically put a sketch underneath of it and you basically trace that cloud and you draw an identifiable 2D sketch of that piece of equipment. And you let mm -hmm. that sketch sit underneath of the cloud so that when the cloud ends up in an assembly, it's that 2D footprint that actually shows up on the drawing, not the cloud. So mm -hmm. it's, it's one little extra step, but it's uh, it's amazing how easy it is to draw a machine if you're tracing the machine instead of conceptually starting from scratch and and having to go look up all the dimensions and all of that. It's You're talking about you know minutes instead of hours or even days to to develop yeah. an asset from a point cloud. Yeah, it's true. Starting from blank page is never easy. Well, yeah, and uh, let's quickly go through the last piece, right? That is, uh, you know, inserting those um, models in Inventor. We already kind of briefly mentioned that, but there is a way to, po uh, to place the point cloud together with the 2D drawings in one model. And this is what we kind of, what is was covered in the course. And we also kind of briefly discussed it today. Yeah, we we give you a we give you the point cloud that you see here. The the point cloud you get is just one corner of a building, but it's enough to it's enough to keep the download small and manageable, but give you the idea of what it would be like to be working in a, in this environment where you've got the 2D footprint, you've got the 3D scan of the building, the digital scan of the building, and then you can fill it up with your assets uh, from the asset browser. Um, there there's gosh. Uh, one of my uh, I'm, I'm looking at another project right now about hanging assets on a wall and they even they even accommodated you here you can take an asset and you can mount it onto the point cloud wall if you want to mm -hmm. so there's a way to snap assets to point clouds so it's it, it's a, a digital uh reality capture is absolutely integrated into the factory design utilities and really has been from the beginning it's uh, I remember being, uh, I think the factory utilities were one of the, it was one of the first tools on the manufacturing side that really did adopt point clouds. Uh, we're talking about 10 years ago, but uh, point clouds were, I think, introduced in the factory utilities before Inventor. So it, it's, uh, it, it's been in a, uh, it's an amazingly mature set of tools and uh, just amazing that, that uh, it, if it's 3D, and you have access to it, there's probably a way we can turn it into an asset or or get it mm -hmm. onto your or include it into your uh, layout design. Yeah, and we'll go into the designing of those uh, parametric assets in a second, but let's quickly recap what we learned so far. So basically what we're getting is that we get a space where we can combine uh, 2D drawings, 2D assets, scans, 3D models into one assembly of the factory floor right. and depending on what we have we can combine different asset types to get what we need with the level of details that we need for the factory floor right and yep. an example you can see here where we combine all of those uh, types of assets and we're going into more like creation mode right because parametric modeling and creating those accurate three models uh, there are ways to do it right and let's talk about some of the uh, past practices here and uh, Rusty could you please lay out the space for parametric design of those assets what's the optimal way to think about it so um, one of the things with assets uh, there, there are really two kinds of assets there are static assets 
which it's just a machine. It's never going to change its shape or size. It's just like the printer in your office. All right. That thing's going to sit in the corner. It's not going to grow. Length, width, and height is not an issue. So for those type of assets, you can just go download those from GrabCAD or someplace. And you, you, you do need to bring them into Inventor and publish them. Inventor is the hub for asset publishing. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you can get it into Inventor, you can turn it into an asset. Um, However, if you want your assets to be dynamic, that's the second type, um, you want to include parameters in the design like length, width, height, uh, anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and one of the things with Inventor, if you're an Inventor user, you're probably, you've already been immersed into parametric design. Um, so you think parametrically when you design and model you, these components, you include length, width, height, or whatever parameters you need, you include them as you're designing the part. You could go in and backfill the parameters from an existing model if you'd like, but uh, you know, you do it officially. You give it, you, you name the parameter the what the, you know, with the appropriate name. And, and uh, once you have it tested to where you can change length, width and height and the model updates correctly, it's just an inventor model. There is, there's no code. You, you, you're more than welcome to include iLogic if you'd like. Um, there is I, iLogic is a part of the inventor environment, but you don't have to. Um, but once you have that model functioning the way you want it as an inventor model, you simply go to the factory utilities and publish it. Uh, there's a, the publishing options in the factory utilities include the landing surface, the connector points, the properties. So there's a few things you want to address as far as publishing, but in the end, it is just an inventor model. You do not have to learn any kind of uh, coding. There's no, they, we used to call it secret sauce. There is no secret sauce that really is, the, these are just inventor models at the end of the day. The, the, one that we, the one that we use in the class is this little parametric shelving system and uh, we can change link width, width and height. We can change the number of shelves in the rack. We can turn off certain legs so that if you have to string this on into another set of shelves, you would have a central set of legs that are being utilized by both shelves. So we can turn parts on and off. We can change the parameter values of things. Uh, I think we build in a, an iLogic rule into this so we, you can incorporate iLogic into your overall design. Um, it's a simple example, but uh, we we uh, we try to follow in the in the lesson. We try to follow the best practices for developing and publishing assets. Uh, and there there are some things that you know we we want, we, we certainly want to encourage you to do. Uh, keep your assets simple. This is uh, a lot of people want to take a production level design with all the nuts and the bolts and the fasteners and all the gears and, and they wanna make that an asset. And that's just, that's overkill. What we need is the outside envelope of this thing. We need it to be recognizable. We need it to be the right size and the correct volume to occupy that space on the floor. And that's about it. We wanna stop there. So um, we, we, we discussed quite a number of best practices in the, in the lesson. Yeah, I just wanted to briefly give an example of uh, iLogic, right? You see right. the representation of the uh, robot arm here is uh, pretty simplistic with, without a lot of details. But what you can do is with iLogic, you can set up uh, almost like a form that allows you to control either the shape or in this case, we're talking about the position of uh, this arm, right? So, which is a great way to automate if you want to go that level of detail. So there is an opportunity to use the, basically the entire power of parametric design and iLogic inside Inventor. Yep, it is, uh, it's spectacular. The, um, the example you see here, let me move something on my screen out of the way, I just wanna make sure yeah, mm -hmm. the, the, the truck there is, uh, we're using iLogic on that one to define the color of the component so you can you have a truck with your logo on the side of it we give you color control on that you can control the text that's on the side of the truck um this this particular asset i created quite a while ago uh this was for an event at a at a speedway at a at a racetrack mm -hmm. so there's another asset that i have it's the race car that goes with this hauler 
Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that happens with the factory assets, you get these connectors, these things that allow them to snap together. Mm -hmm. One of the things the connectors can do is pass data from the original asset to the new asset. So when you hook up the race car to this hauler, it, it adopts the color scheme, it adopts the, the logo of the sponsor, uh, and it, it all, it, so you only have to input that information one time and anything I hook up to this will automatically adapt to suit the settings in the first object. So mm -hmm. um, those are via connector classes and uh, uh, I've got, again, one of the classes I taught at AU was, uh, um, uh, gosh, the asset development checklist. And this particular class session was a derivative of the asset development checklist, where we covered a lot of the things you want to think about when you publish assets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, um, you go here over uh, some of the best practices, right? Some of them we already mentioned that very often we don't need the, um, like, full level of details and we can right. go into shrink wrap and other simplification tools yep. available in inventor to convert assemblies with lots of details into simplified shapes right and yep. uh, again we use standard inventor um, functionality to do that right yep yep ideally we uh, ideally we like to have the assets be a single part if possible uh, that's mm -hmm. not always the case the robot that you showed is actually an asset of an assembly which they um they take the, the constraints and they're linked into the iLogic form and that's a great little asset. But um, on, the, on the robot side, as an example, there were no internal gears or, or any cords or, or um, ribbon cable and all of that. It was just the external shape of that robot. That's really what we care about on the layout side is just to get the outside envelope of our design in place and recognizable for the final drawing. The shrink wrap is, uh, you know, if you, you shrink wrap is just one way to take an assembly of parts, convert it to a single component. Um, shrink wrap uh, or derive component are there are great ways to get rid of detail as well. Fill in all the holes, fill in all the voids, uh, convert uh, complex shapes to either boxes or cylinders. So there there are tools that will that can help you simplify your production level designs into an asset. Or you always want to remember, you could just start a brand new file and just mock up a simple version of your complex design. It does not have to be overly detailed. Yeah, and uh, I mean, since we have just 15 minutes left, I wanted to accelerate a little bit and cover what we haven't discussed so far is... Uh, process analysis, right? Uh, let's quickly discuss it in two forms, right? The one available in Inventor, and then I wanted to briefly mention the alternative uh, uh, here. And uh, do you mind covering really quickly in terms of process analysis, why is it there and what's the best way to kind of use it in practice, right? Not, not theoretically, what's the most Yep. significant practical implication. So I think I, when every time I introduce process analysis, I always say this, I think as designers, we jump into CAD way too early. We jump into CAD and we start putting notes in CAD and things like that. And really those notes are really aimed at a tool like process analysis. Process analysis is a uh, flow chart. It's a flow chart generator. It's an animated flow chart. It allows you to throw all of your ideas you know, hey, I need to get this much product out of my process. I have these people that I have to rely on. I have these machines that have to be arranged. I don't care about the building at this point. I don't care about the layout. I just care about feeds and speeds. And uh, mm -hmm. how many hours am I going to, I'm am I going to work my workforce? Uh, so these tools allow you to put um, the same assets you have in in the AutoCAD and Inventor, you have access to those, but you can bring those in and you can define processes and uh, you can have product go through these processes. You can track time, you can, can you can track, dis well, not distance yet, but you can track time. Uh, time is the really the key factor here, but you can also track output. Um, and it, it is a very much a, a very simple interface to learn 
there's only a few things that you, you processors, sources, objects, buffers, people, uh, products. But this is where you crunch the numbers, and this is where you try to get you know the theoretical model of your flow, your workflow down, so that you have a goal. Uh, really, you can lay the groundwork for what your digital model has to uh, deliver. Uh, and you know this is where we can do so many different scenarios. Uh, you can dream up the idea that, hey, if I buy another press, if I can incorporate another machine into the line, what's that going to have impact on to the overall time it takes to get a load of uh, 100 products done? How much mm -hmm. is that going to cut down in the overall time scheme of things? Or maybe I hire another person. I hate to say this, maybe I get rid of another person. And, but, and let this guy, you know, expect him to do twice as much work. You can model all of that out without ever having to open a CAD system. And, uh, and that's where process analysis is. It's early on, usually in the design phase. It's usually where you start. Um, uh, I think, again, quite often we have so many designers that kind of skip this because they already have an idea of what their workflow need, their flows need to be. Mm -hmm. But this is where you can prove your design. You can prove it out here ahead of time. You can generate the reports and the math that go with uh, the overall design. You can seek approval at this point. Um, process analysis is a, um, it does have a limitation, I guess I would say. It is a very lightweight process analysis tool. Um, I, I like to conf I compare it to the FEA that's in Inventor. So FEA, mm -hmm. Inventor has FEA, but it's like a first order iteration. Mm -hmm. If you want real high powered FEA analysis, you you jump into a, another high end FEA tool. Um, so process analysis is a great starting point, very, very functional. Um, mm -hmm. But there are, uh, there are other alternatives that tie directly into the factory design utilities. Um, yeah, Pro well, model is, is, the, is the one I'm, I'm most familiar with. Yeah, and uh, we'll touch it briefly. And uh, just uh, since we're talking, is there like basic uh, statistics analysis and uh, process analysis? Sure. Or you, okay. you can analyze yeah, the data. You can analyze the data for time. You can analyze the data for product throughput. Uh, and then, of course, once you have that equation, you can start playing with the numbers. You can actually export the whole thing to Excel and then start to, to really do some number crunching there. Um, process analysis, just in case you've never used it, also can produce an AutoCAD drawing. It can produce the initial mm -hmm. workflow diagram that you can bring into AutoCAD, and then you can re replace the, uh, you can put your assets in place. Uh, you can then start to place the assets in context of the building. So uh, it does tie in directly to the workflow. It feeds AutoCAD. AutoCAD would then feed Inventor, Inventor would then feed Navisworks, and the whole cycle would repeat at some point. Yeah, and this is exactly what's covered in the fourth course, the full yeah. cycle that we spoke about all the way from uh, you know 1D or process analysis right. and 2D in AutoCAD, 3D in Inventor, all the way up to releasing uh, parts, parts list and quick drawing about the factory. And uh, then we wanted to briefly mention, because we, we want to be cautious about the time, ProModel is the tool that is not available with the inventor, right? So it's a separate purchase. It's the partnership that we uh, recently started with uh, that company. But we wanted to mention that this option is available as a consideration when you need it, right? Because uh, uh, process analysis is there in inventor and ProModel uh, does a little bit more and the, uh, resting the interest of time. Can you briefly mention about like what are some of the major differences, right? I, I, I can tell you the major difference and it, it's, it's um, let me ask, I'll ask anyone on the call today, how long does a task take? So with process analysis, you have to give it one answer. This task takes 10 minutes. Well, does it really take 10 minutes or does it take, sometimes it takes eight minutes, sometimes it takes 11, but, mm -hmm. the, but the average I have to then, once I start incorporating averages, my end result becomes questionable. Well, pro model has a way that we can, we can actually say, how long does a task take? Well, it takes between eight minutes and 11, 
but mostly it takes, you know, more than not around 10 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. And then with pro model, I don't just run the analysis one time. I run it hundreds of times. So it runs all different scenarios of that task time and incorporates all of those into mm -hmm. the final answer. So it takes its, its level of computation is an order above what you get with process analysis. Just mm -hmm. in the fact that it's it, it runs the test hundreds of times before it gives you its result. Where process analysis is, is a one and done. It, you, you plug in your best guesses and you hit the button and you have to rely on the single answer. So um, that, that's, yeah. my, that's my interpretation of it. Yeah, so it's basically on, it adds quite a bit of things, uh, but uh, more importantly, kind of more statistical analysis and it, it can do more things. But again, it's not, this tool is not included with uh, factory design utilities and I wanted to mention that, yep. right? But anyway, we just wanted to kind of lay out the landscape of what's available. Um, and uh, I wanted to quickly recap and then jump to your questions. Uh, important milestone next month, November is our regular, uh, like the biggest conference that we have called Autodesk University. It usually happens in Las Vegas, it's in person, it's an amazing event, but not everyone can get to Las Vegas. And this year, one of the you know few uh, positives that it brought that uh, it democratized a lot of things, including Autodesk University. So Autodesk University is uh, much more open than it's uh, it usually is, um, and uh, it now let me quickly copy the links so I can drop it in the chat. Uh, so this year, Autodesk University is free. Uh, it will have different program programming. So we'll have day one, which is uh, online. We'll have all the keynotes, uh, on demand, pre-recorded classes that will be available. Uh, during AU and after AU, and also you will have live answer bars and expo that is uh, scheduled for live demos. Days two through four, they are more like community gatherings, a lot of meetups, lots of flies, live answer bars. It's the time for community to engage at the time when it works for them, including some local events in your languages. So you're, if you are based in Germany, if you are based in Japan, there is a chance that there is uh, an event that is going on and community driven in your location, in your language. So this is AU this year, I will drop the link. And also uh, we mentioned like everything that we covered today, right? We wanted to kind of lay out the landscape, but the information that we covered today is available in the form of courses that we created. Uh, Rusty created those courses. We published them on Autodesk Customer Success Hub. Uh, and uh, I will drop the link to how to access them in the chat. So copy those links. Uh, we have all the links uh, that we mentioned today and uh, register to the next mechanical engineering meetup. Uh, it will happen during AU. It will be on the second day of AU. Uh, and it will be just, I would say it's a celebration of everything that we achieved um, this year. And we'll quickly go through all the different topics that we covered, invite speakers that uh, um, were here last year. Um, so join it next month and you have the link in the chat as well. Now let's go into questions. And since I was sharing uh, today, um, I didn't see. Um... We've got a question. Um, there's one, uh, and I can't expand this window. So, um, what are the benefits if 98% of the job I do is re-engineering the assets we already have? Um, so that is, that's a very specific thing. It's the factory layout utilities is really the idea of laying out the factory, getting the the footprint of the building correct. You're going to be working alongside people who are designing the machines. Now, if, if your focus is in the design of the machines, yes, you're, you're, you are going to be focused more on the inventor side of things. Um, however, if you can quantify those changes that you're making to those assets, if it's always length, width, height, um, feed, or, or motor sizes, there might be the opportunity to incorporate parametric design into your 
existing models and uh, possibly create an asset that has uh, a 98% chance of being able to you know, modify length, width, height, uh, thickness, uh, width, so that it, it conforms to the needs of the people that are going to install it. So that's a tough question to answer. I, 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 uh, uh, certainly, you have the ability to incorporate parameters, and uh, uh, I hope you can. And let's see. I, I just cannot get to this other question here. Uh, yeah, I see other questions, and um, yeah, the interesting question is, uh, well, uh, they're all great questions, but what's the difference between uh, AutoCAD uh, factory design utilities in AutoCAD and AutoCAD Plan 3D, right? So, because factory and right. plant could be confusing from the naming standpoint. So, I, I'll share with you my idea. Plant 3D is a plant is usually taking material and usually forcing it through pipes uh, to go from one type of processing to another type of processing. So w when you talk about plant 3D, I initially think of P&ID and, and uh, have these massive pipe runs to, to move material from one place to the next. That is, that is what plant 3D is good at. Um, factory design is the factory layout of the other machines in the building. Um, that are going to work and incorporate into that overall process. So if you need P and ID, all right, if, if you are in that particular discipline, Plant 3D is going to be your tool of designing choice. But at some point, if you're going to incorporate your plant data into factory, there are workflows to either incorporate the factory layout into the Plant 3D model, or you can export the Plant 3D model and get it into the factory layout. So it's not an either or, all right? There are going to be situations where you have to use both. Um, but the, the Plant 3D is not a member of the product design manufacturing collection. So um, that would be a separate uh, purchase. Uh, well, it's uh, Plant 3D is a part of one AutoCAD, right? So it right. means that if there is a license for AutoCAD, then all the tool uh, sets are available, uh, including Plant 3D, right? Okay. Let's say it that way. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. So I couldn't agree more. So think about it more like uh, if it's a processing plant with pipes and plant 3D and factory utilities is is usually something different, right? Right. Uh, there is another great question, more like around automation. Is uh, what if we want to have advanced controls over the factory model using MATLAB or C++? So I'm not sure about MATLAB, but C++ uh, Inventor has open API. It means that it's fully documented. It has all the controls, and you can connect and control Inventor using C++. C sharp in other modern languages, um, so uh, it is possible. So the answer is yes. Uh, not the entire factory design utilities functionality, right? Because it, it's kind of it's a it's an add-in on top of Inventor. So it's not necessarily that every function of factory design will be used through API. But I would reference the developer documentation to um, uh, to check out the details. And then a final a question that we will be able to take today is uh, a Revit MEP uh, compared with uh, Inventor. Um, so Rusty, do you wanna take that one or I can cover up? Well, I mean, Revit is the architectural uh, tool of choice for architectural design. So uh, it's really important to understand that Inventor can import Revit data and Revit can import Inventor data. Uh, it, when we're talking about the factory layout process, I would I would always recommend that the factory should stay on the Inventor side of the fence throughout the production phase. So what I typically see is architects delivering Revit files to me and then I, in some way, shape, or form, bring those into Inventor, and I incorporate them into the overall design. So uh, absolutely, we can take those Revit models and incorporate them into the design. We can take our assets if we have to. At the end of the day, we can get them through uh, through the 
translations. We can get them back into Revit if they have to be there. Uh, remember that we also have Navisworks. At the mm -hmm. end of the day, we can throw all of our data into Navisworks to see how it all interacts together. So Navisworks reads all that stuff. Yeah, and uh, we are at the time. I wanted to quickly recap. We, we spoke about a lot of things today, but good news is that you don't need to memorize it all right now, right? Because uh, everything that we spoke about today is captured in the courses uh, created by Rusty. You have all the files, all the projects, all the exercises. Uh, you can review them using the link that I dropped in the chat, uh, or you can go to Autodesk Customer Success Hub and find it there. Also, we highly encourage you to register to Autodesk University next month. And as a part of the Uni Autodesk University program, we have our next mechanical engineering meetup where we will bring more exciting news, in probably including uh, the new project that we're working with uh, Rusty around the using factory design utilities for social distancing measures and uh, kind of reworking factory layout and processes in order to you know kind of rearrange factory floors for the new world right this is coming so we'll talk about that uh, next time so stay tuned and huge thanks for joining us today it's great having you as well as Rusty. Huge thanks to you uh, for joining us today and talking about the great uh, learning content that you created. Thank you guys. Appreciate you guys uh, allowing me to speak to you guys and hope to talk to you all later. Yeah, thank you so much and have a great uh, rest of your day. Y'all take care. Bye. Bye.